Ted, Ted's work has always struck me as being very bold, inventive, and ingenious, uh, and always very interesting. Um, I, I've also, also been very impressed with the way that I think Ted, um, Ted's idea is that in philosophy, it, the subject works because you put out your ideas and people react to them. Uh, and he's, he's never been um, <coughs> unwilling to do that. And, and that is how the subject works. And that's why Ted's contributions have been very important. And I want to make two other remarks which have been, as it were, inspired in me by actually two people I met before this session started. Um, one, is, one is meeting Tim. And I think um, what became clear to me was that in your role as Grote, Professor, a multifaceted role, but one of the roles of the Grote is to make appointments. And I think there's no doubt that during your time as a Grote, Professor, you made some very, very good appointments to the philosophy department at, at UCL, one of whom was Tim, and others that, that of course, we all, we all know. And you, you displayed you know, very good quality in that respect. And secondly, um, this is talking to Barry, it struck me that in some ways, Ted, you are one of the what might be called public philosophers, leading public philosophers in this country. That is to say, you are a philosopher who takes the role of commenting on and engaging with practical matters in the world very seriously, in a way that philosophers should do, but most of us have failed to do so. But you are someone who succeeded in that and you, have, you, you, you can merit the description public, public philosopher. That's a, that's a real achievement. Um, OK, so I'm pleased to be here, and, and I wanted to say those things first. But I am going to, like Tim, um, <coughs> in a sense, pay you the compliment of disagreeing with you uh, in the way that normally happens on these occasions. I also want to apologize in that it may be that my own discussion overlaps a little bit with what Tim said himself, because I also want to talk about uh, your views on consciousness. Okay. Um, now, I, I, I think that actualism, the view that you are propounding, is in a sense, a, is, a, is a view still in progress. It isn't a view in which, from your point of view, everything has been nailed down completely. It's a view which, the general approach of which, the structure of which is clear enough, but there, there may be elements in it where um, you're still grappling with and might, and might change your mind about. Uh, it's also complex and extensive, and so in, in a short talk, one can only scratch the surface of this view. There are, so there's much in it that I'm going to be completely ignoring. Maybe the important bits I'll be ignoring. Okay. Um, what I want to say is, it's not that I'm wanting to invite you to join me in thinking something in the way that Tim was, but I'm slightly, my, my approach is to refuse your invitation to join you in thinking what you think. But I'm not trying to persuade you particularly of a view that I hold. Okay. Let's just spell out actualism very, very briefly because Tim did that, Tim did that so, so well. Um, the, question, the question is, what is consciousness? What's the best theory of consciousness? Ted divides consciousness into these three categories of the perceptual, the cognitive, and the affective. Um, he's very impressed by the extent of disagreements amongst people who think and write about consciousness. That, that there's no unanimity people go off in quite different directions. This leads him to the good idea of trying to um, establish what he calls, I think, a database of facts about consciousness which can act as um, an anchor on what consciousness is that we're trying to provide an account of. So you have the database, and as, as Tim pointed out, the database is summarized in the phrase, consciousness, consciousness is something's being actual. 
Okay. Now, uh, as Tim also said, no one can disagree with that. That remark really can't be disagreed with. The actual, as it were, remarks that that's summarizing, that's, that's a different matter. But I'm not myself going to pick away or query those. <coughs> um, anyway, so the, the, we've got to this stage. Ted has his database, which is intended to um, eliminate disagreements about what the theory of consciousness is about because it defines the topic, it defines the subject matter. Now, uh, one of the things that um, hit me as I was reading Ted's, the new manuscript that Ted very kindly circulated, yet not a manuscript that's yet come out, but it's a shortened presentation of his views on actualism. When I was reading that, um, it hit me for the first time, although it should have hit me a long, long time ago, but it was, it was reading Ted that this hit me, um, is that although one can formulate the question, what is consciousness? One just says, look, that's the initial question. What is consciousness? Or give me a theory of consciousness. Okay. Um, in fact, the, as it were, the interests and theoretical angles of people who ask this can themselves vary quite considerably. Okay. Um, and so one of the reasons why, in a sense, there's apparent disagreement in the theory of consciousness needn't be that people are disagreeing as to what consciousness is, but their interests in and what they want to understand can be quite different. Thus, um, if you think about the way philosophers have standardly theorized about consciousness, um, <clears throat> to a large extent, they've treated it as the mind-body problem. Right? The mind-body problem is what's the relation between mental phenomenon, consciousness included, and the term body stands for physical phenomena. And, and philosophers have tried to give an answer to that question about consciousness. What is the relation between, might be called, occurrences of consciousness and physical occurrences, bodily occurrences? That's the mind-body problem. Now, roughly, um, there are kind of two answers to the mind-body problem between which people are competing, roughly. Now, I may, I may be miscounting here, and Ted, Ted perhaps would count it differently. But, but very roughly, on one side, there are the physicalists slash materialists who hold that consciousness and mentality comes down to physical states of affairs and physical things. The ter one term that they might use is there's a reductive relation here. The mental can be reduced in some sense to the physical. So that's physicalism and materialism. And the other, the other kind of answer would be people who say that's wrong. The mental is not reducible to the physical. It has a nature which um, <clears throat> means it's to some extent distinct from the physical. It's not simply some physical state of affairs. And in current terminology, um, that would be, that kind of approach would be called some sort of dualism. Some sort of dualism. Okay. Um, now, what, what's absolutely obvious when you think about it is, suppose you take the first view that consciousness is a physical phenomenon. It's reducible to the physical. And you say, well, that's, that's my account. That's my answer to the question. That actually is an answer which contains very little information, really. Uh, and, and people would want to know far, far more about consciousness than simply, oh, well, it can be reduced to the physical. For example, lots of people will, want, will think of consciousness as a kind of a complex presence that we possess, and obviously you're going to be able to, in some sense, to decompose it into elements in the way you can decompose things that we might have a single name for, but things which occur to us and give us all sorts of things. 
And then you think, well, some sort of top-down analysis of what's involved in consciousness is what, we, is what they would want. Okay? And there is also the other side, the bottom-up approach, who would be looking um, for, might be called, on anyone's view, the physical processes which are linked to consciousness. The complex physical processes, even if they don't constitute consciousness, but are the ones which are involved in the presence of consciousness in some way or other. So there are top-down questions and there are bottom-up questions. And simply solving the mind-body problem, one way or the other, doesn't say, doesn't answer those questions. And so um, this is not a disagreement with Ted. It's wanting to uh, express a thought which is inspired by his sense of how varied views are that are expressed about consciousness. And I, I think that's partly due to uh, a variety in theoretical goals that people who study consciousness have. Okay, now, <coughs> in expounding test theory, we've got to the point that there's a, there's a database, and that fixes the phenomenon we're talking about on the one side, but secondly, it's going to be exploited or relied on in arguments about consciousness. Okay, so it has a dual role. Now, the theory that emerges, the theory that emerges, actualism, <coughs> that <coughs> Tim was talking about, seems to me you can divide it into two sides. Okay? There's a negative side. According to actualism, a number of leading ideas about consciousness are wrong. Okay? In particular, two massive ideas are wrong. One is, if I've understood Ted, physicalism slash materialism is wrong. Consciousness cannot be reduced to the physical. It is not reducible to the physical. Secondly, dualism is wrong. Okay. Dualism incorporates certain <coughs> kinds of mistakes and so should be rejected as well. Again, on the basis of, as it were, data that's available in the database. Um, now, there's a slight problem for me <coughs> at this stage. If we put together a few of the things I've just said, and so I am sure that um, uh, someone will explain to me where I'm going wrong. But roughly, the three things is, are these, are that Ted rejects materialism and he rejects dualism. But basically, when you think about the mind-body problem in the way that philosophers do, you basically face a choice between those two options, right? So um, how can this be? How can this be? Well, I'm not going to answer that. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, bits of this talk, which is, I think, could be described as careless, is that I'm not really clarifying in any very um, acceptable way what materialism is or what dualism is. I'm just relying on people in the audience to have a sense of what these views are. Okay, and, and this is going to leave a gap in my discussion. There's definitely a gap in my discussion at this point. Now, what I want to, what I want to do is to express some reservations about why Ted rejects physicalism and also express some reservations about why Ted rejects dualism, okay? which will leave me at the end as not going along with his two major negative proposals. And, and along the way, I, I, if I've got time, I might take a swipe at his own positive proposal uh, along some of the lines that Tim, I think, guided us to already. Okay, why does... So here, here's the question, first question. Why does Ted reject physicalism? What is so wrong about physicalism in Ted's eyes? Um, now, in the handout, um, in the, uh, towards the bottom of the first page, there's the quote which comes right at the beginning of his book, and which I'll read. Uh, how have I got this? Yes, this is it. Uh, it says, 
a lot of us have inclinations or impulses about our being conscious that just don't work out. One may be common enough among neuroscientists and impressionable students of philosophy is that consciousness is a matter of stuff fundamentally the same as the stuff of or in the ordinary chairs under them. That doesn't work because we're sure that consciousness is really somehow different in kind. Okay, that's the point he makes right at the beginning of his exposition. Now, when I read this remark, um, uh, I was unhappy about two things in it. Um, <clears throat> the first was, surely physicalists are not saying consciousness is a matter of stuff, right? No one would say consciousness is a matter of stuff. Rather, consciousness would be states or processes or occurrences that go on in us and do things for us. Okay. But then it, stu then it struck me, of course, that Ted was using the word stuff here in the, in, in the sense in which it can be used in the following phrase, a lot of stuff has gone on between us, that kind of expression. Now, that's not referring to material or physical stuff. That's referring to occurrences, things that have occurred. Stuff can occur. So the, the reading of stuff in this first remark is stuff that occurs. Okay, But then the second unhappiness I felt when I read it was surely uh, physicalists aren't really saying that might be called the, the nature of consciousness is something which um, can be present in chairs, right? The stuff that's present in a chair isn't the right kind of stuff for consciousness, which is why no one thinks that chairs are conscious, right? But again, Ted knows that, and I think the stuff that's in chairs just was his term for anything physical, right? Anything physical. So talking about the stuff in chairs, that's physical stuff, and so he just means anything that's physical. Okay, so let's, let's put those two um, hesitations that I felt aside. Now the question though is, uh, why does Ted feel so sure that people think this approach is wrong? And I've got three remarks I want to make just about this point. One is, um, well it's not true that most of us um, feel like saying, oh, physicalism is wrong. Okay. Um, the dominant view in philosophy, at least since the kind of 1950s, has been that something like physicalism is true. Since the emergence of the psychophysical identity theory, kind of in the late 1950s, early 1960s, pioneered in Australia and in the States, since that view emerged, I think most philosophers would subscribe to some form of physicalism. Okay, there are lots of exceptions, but most of them would. So it's not just impressionable students of philosophy uh, or a few neuroscientists. Um, secondly, the second point I want to make is this. Um, if anyone has this general conviction that consciousness has to be distinct from the physical, okay, I don't think that they can sustain that conviction unless they locate some value which captures the difference. Okay? That is to say, if you're thinking about why consciousness can't just be something physical, you have to come up with some property, which I call in the handout C, such that one, one can say of C, consciousness possesses this property C, but physical occurrences and states do not and cannot possess property C, hence you cannot reduce the former <coughs> to the latter. In other words, there has to be candidate values for this property C. In the absence of coming up with something like that, the general conviction that consciousness has to be something different seems to me to be one which uh, one would just have to abandon. Uh, it wouldn't have any kind of adequate basis uh, 
one just says, well, I've got this strong sense it has to be something different, but I can't put my finger on any reason why, so I think I'll just have to go and leave that behind. But the third point I want to make is finding a candidate for C is remarkably difficult, it seems to me. Okay. And the, the reason why it's difficult can be brought out by thinking about the case that Ted um, devotes most attention to, as Tim pointed out, that the idea of conscious perceptual experiences. Okay. Conscious perceptual experiences. Things like, um, it's looking to me here and now that there's a room. Or maybe me, it's, it's, my, it's being the case that I am here and now seeing a room. These are conscious perceptual experiences. Now, if someone says, describe the experience, describe this experience, say what features and properties it has, okay, what can we say? Well, actually, what we would say is something a bit like what Ted himself wants to say um, <coughs> at various points in his own theory. I mean, what we would say is things like, um, it looks to me as if it, there are grey walls to this room. I'm having a ex conscious experience in which it appears to me as if there's a room with grey walls and pictures, etc., etc., etc. Okay. In other words, the descriptions that a request to describe this experience would elicit would be descriptions of the apparent object of the perceptual experience. Right? I might say, and it's been going on for five minutes, and things like that. So those are the, those are the properties that undergoing the experience put me in touch with as properties of the experience. Right, things like that. Now, uh, what undergoing the experience doesn't put me in touch with is anything else about the character of the experience. It doesn't inform me as to what kind of nature the experience has, how it happens, what kind of level of processing is involved in it. Nothing like that is manifest to me at all. Now, if it's the case that the fundamental descriptions that undergoing the experience equip me with are experiences about how things appear, okay, then the second part of such arguments, which have got to be to show that physical things cannot have these properties, reduces to saying, well, physical processes cannot be processes in which it appears to you as if something is the case. Right? Now, what I cannot see at a general level is how anyone has any reason for saying that. Right? Because how do we know in advance what properties complex physical occurrences might actually have. And why couldn't a very complex physical occurrence have a property such as being one which when you undergo this physical process, it appears to you as if there's a room? Okay. So my, my worry is that the poverty of description of experience that undergoing experiences provides us with is never going to provide us with descriptions which we can then argue physical processes cannot exhibit or cannot possess. So I'm trying to say, actually, um, if the third point is correct, <coughs> the general conviction that there has to be a difference is one which is very hard to sustain. Now, I think that Ted um, agrees, agrees with this, really. And in the course of his argument, he comes up with specific values for differences between consciousness and what we call physical things. Okay, and this is on... It's on the... Let me try and think, which page is this? Um, it's under the table. Okay, because I just want to very briefly talk about the table, Ted's table. And these are points 10, 11, and 12 on the table. 
Okay. What's going on on the table at that point is that Ted is distinguishing between the physical and consciousness and the mental by labeling consciousness and the mental as subjective, whereas he wants to label the physical objective. Okay. And so those two columns, in particular the values 10, 11, and 12, um, are where he's putting forward the contrasts that I think ultimately he's relying on. But I want to ask, are they, do, these con do these contrasts really exist? Okay. So let's, let me just be very, very brief here. Um, number 10. When he's talking about the physical, he says the physical is objective in that it's separate from consciousness. However, conscious experiences are not separate from consciousness, so that's a difference between the physical and consciousness. Okay, that's how this, 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 this contrast is going. But if you think about that, well, uh, sorry, here's one thought about that. That contrast begs the question. If it is the case that physicalism is true, if that is the case, and there are conscious occurrences which amount to Sorry, there are physical occurrences which amount to the presence of consciousness. Those physical occurrences are not separate from consciousness. They are occurrences which, once they occur, bring consciousness with them. And so you cannot say that it's part of the physical that they have to be separate from consciousness. Unless you've already ruled out physicalism. Okay, so that's my reply to that particular value. Now... The second contrast is public and private. Okay, and what, what's going on there? Well, th it, these are kind of slightly sloganistic. And I'm not sure whether I'm going to summarize the contrast properly here, but roughly, when you look at it, what Ted is saying is that physical states of affairs, physical things, are not tied to an individual, right? Whereas conscious states are tied to individuals such as us. Your conscious states couldn't occur unless you, that individual having them, were there. But physical states are not tied to um, individuals. They are public. They are public. Okay. But I think, again, uh, the characterization of the physical um, shouldn't be accepted as a general claim. Um, and, and here's my kind of example. Um, presumably, if I have a seizure in the next few minutes, right, that isn't an event which could happen without me, right? It's my seizure. And unless I'm there, it cannot occur. However, it is a physical happening. It's some sort of awful complex set of things happening in my body, a seizure. So it is tied to an individual. That physical occurrence is private to an individual. So one cannot simply say the mental, sorry, the physical is public. Okay, there's a sense in which it's public, but that's not the sense that's in question. Okay, and thirdly, now the third one, number twelve, um, is is the, the epistemological difference between our access to the physical and to consciousness and the mental. Um, and clearly, T Ted has here, is here uh, saying things which a lot of people find quite plausible, that there might be an epistemological difference between the mental and the physical. Um, and as he says, th there's privileged access to the mental or to consciousness. Um, <coughs> Well, what does that mean? What does privileged access mean? And as far as I can see, it means one of two things. It can either mean that, there's a, that when you are, there's a way you have of learning about your conscious mental states which other people don't have as a way of learning about your conscious mental states. So you have a privileged route onto them 
which other people lack. Okay, now uh, that's, that looks true. That looks true to me. Um, however, this doesn't mark out the mental as against the physical because you have a privileged route of access to your physical states which other people lack in relation to your physical states. Namely, you have inner perceptual roots which tell you how your body is, dis is, is shaped, is what it is doing, what its form is, and that's a privileged access to a physical state of affairs. So it, 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 there isn't, again, a general contrast between the mental and the physical in relation to the existence of privileged <laughs> access in that sense. Or privileged access can mean something like, well, you have a route whereby uh, you just must know how things are with you mentally, right? Whereas you, it's not true that you just must know how things are with you physically. Okay. But is that contrast sound either? Is that contrast sound? Um, it looks to me as if it can at least be queried. It can be queried. In particular, um, there are all sorts of ways in which your awareness of your own mental states and your own states of consciousness can fail. That's what impresses me. Um, <clears throat> it isn't like if you're in a certain conscious mental state, you just must absolutely know that you are. You don't have that privilege. Things can go wrong in all sorts of ways. So in that case, I'm inclined to query the existence of privileged roots onto your consciousness, if it means that. In which case, again, the contrast evaporates. Um, Okay, so what I'm going to say then, and I'll stop at this point, I think I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave my proto-defense of dualism aside, um, and I'll, I'll ignore that. Uh, what, what, I, what I'm wanting to say is that the very general idea that there's a contrast between consciousness and the physical is an idea which, unless it can be substantiated by particular details and examples, should not be trusted. But the detailed cases that you bring forward, if I've understood the argument, are not ones which it seems to me uh, persuade me that there is such a contrast. And so, so I am inclined to refuse your invitation to throw physicalism out of the window. Okay. Though I, I'm quite sure that illumination is just about to hit me in the face. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Among the many true things I've said in the course of my life, one was that Paul Snowden was a better growth than me. And indeed, I think his discussion today demonstrates that again, which is not to say that I agree. <laughs> The curse of dealing with an able and productive philosopher, hard at it for half an hour, is that you find yourself having written down 20 points and you can't remember them all and um, you're not quite sure how to deal with this bugger. But let me try a little bit. Um, he began with comments very sympathetic to physicalism, very sympathetic to physicalism. And he said virtually all existing serious philosophers of mind, he was pretty close to that, were physicalists in some sense. And at the end, I rather think I heard some very sympathetic comments about something called dualism. Now, Paul's a little uncertain where I am. I sure am uncertain where he is if he's both a physicalist and a dualist. If I can approach this by way of the handout. Has everybody got the handout? <coughs> it's got a table on it. And the table is really a 
summary of the view. And as you'll see, it consists in a genus, G-E-N-U-S, of all that exists, indeed all that exists. And the genus divides into um, It divides into two species for a start. I'm afraid perhaps the reproduction does not actually show that. But what it amounts to is that everything that exists is physical. Everything that exists is physical. I happen to be somebody who holds that. And the physical divides up into two species. And the first one is, and that's the left-hand column, has all those characteristics, the objective physical world. And that's where the chairs are. So the physical world generally, that genus, has two species, of which the first is the objective physical world, all the characteristics down the left-hand column, that's the chairs. And the second species is subjective physicality. That's the right-hand one. And that divides up. I see the lines down there in the reproduction. I've got a little screwy. Subjective physicality divides up into two subspecies, subjective physical worlds and subjective physical representations. Now, if you keep all that in mind and ask the question, is this a physicalism or a dualism, which is perhaps implied by some of the things Paul had to say, one first reply is, Everything about consciousness in the philosophy of mind is a dualism because all philosophers of mind who address the question of consciousness make a difference between it and the rest. That's true of Dennett. Even the disabled Dennett knows <laughs> that there's a difference between consciousness and the rest. Well, that is something that we've got to recognize. We've got to somehow be dualists in the sense of making a difference. But at the same time, and this is the other thing that um, really gets hold of me, um, where the chairs are is caused by somebody's mental carry-on and arranging them in here. So there is causal connection between consciousness and where the chairs are. There's causal connection between consciousness and objective physicality, in which case consciousness, to be just engage in a quick slummy sentence, has to be somehow like the physical. It's got to be in space for a start. It can't be out of space and affect what is in space. So you've got as it seems to me, really these two imperatives. You've got to make consciousness different. It is different from the chairs. Paul rather suggested that uh, you couldn't be sure about that. But if I regard the chairs as being a matter of objective physicality, which I lay out in detail, that left-hand column, if I regard the chairs as instances of objective physicality, we all agree that there's something different with respect to us. And equally, and this is the other, so to speak, ruling idea in all this, and it's certainly a common one, I'm perfectly persuaded that somebody's ideas, in a general sense, somebody acting on an instruction, got the chairs where they are in this room now, in which case there has to be some reality 
to the ideas. And indeed, to go a little further than uh, I said in anything I've written, they've got to take up some space. How can what takes up no space affect what is in space? It seems to me that the view you have in front of you both makes consciousness real, and therefore it makes it possibly causal, and it makes it different. And the difference is in that table. Consciousness is physical. It's subjectively physical. And if you ask me what I mean by that, I bloody tell you it's down there in those 16 characteristics as you read down the column. And what it is to be, that is what it is to be objectively physical. And what it is to be subjectively physical turns up in the two right-hand columns. Now, all of that seems to me commonsensical. It seems to me that Paul made a meal of that. And he said a lot of things that unsettled me a little bit. But let me reply to that part of what he said by saying something like this. Well, saying a lot of things. Philosophy is harder. Philosophy is harder than science. Philosophy is a lot harder than neuroscience. And the reason, effectively, is that neuroscience, being a good science, has facts in it. And they settle things. They bloody settle things. What happens in philosophy? Well, we pay attention to facts. But what we're up to is carrying forward judgment from the facts. And the judgment consists in a number of things. It seems to me that the thing I've put together, which is a matter of judgment and is captured in that table, is open to lots of possible nagging. And Paul has done some good questioning of that sort. But I can't quite see that uh, those small objections ruin the entire project. Let me put the project to you again, and I'll stop. I'm sorry this is a case of repeating myself, but the truth really seduces one into repetition. Yes, consciousness issues in the location of chairs. Consciousness must then, in some sense, be real. It must somehow be physical. That has to be an axiom of all our reflections. It can't be otherworldly stuff. It can't be platonic nonsense. It's got to be itself somehow real. It's got to be, amongst other things, spatial. But we all agree. There's a fundamental difference between the objective physicality of the chairs and the reality of our conscious thoughts and inclinations and desires. What are you going to do when you hold those, as it seems to me, simple and simple-minded views? Well, you're going to have to come to something which finds consciousness within the realm of the physical, look at the table. That's where it is. Everything on that table is physical. That's what the genus is at the top. But it's the case that it divides into the subjectively physical and the objectively physical. And that isn't left vague or general. It's not loose talk. All you get is all that labored stuff the uh, 16 differences between the two. And I stop by saying that's better than dualism, and it's better than objective physicalism. And I think the better class of Grote professor ought to join me in these reflections. Thank you. Okay, thank you.